On behalf of McKinsey and Company, eh, welcome to this discussion on our new landmark report, The Bio-Revolution, Bio Innovations Transforming Economies, Societies and Our Lives. My name is Matthias Evers. I'm a senior partner and global leader of R&D in the pharma biotech practice at McKinsey. Before we begin, allow me to thank uh, our friends at Bio for convening this important uh, session as part of the Bio International Digital Convention. We are honored to have BIOS new CEO president, uh, Dr. Michelle McCurry hees with us. She will provide a few introductory remarks. And I, I might say this was meant to be because we released the research on the same day she got announced. <laughs> um, before I hand over to Michelle, let me also introduce the other panel members. So for, uh, firstly, with me today is my colleague, Michael Chui a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute, which is the firm's business and economics research arm. Together, Michael and I will present for, say, 15, 20 minutes our findings and then open the panel. He will lead it. We will then invite um, a number of bio-revolutionaries bio to, to the panel discussion. There's, on the one hand, Klaus Kron Fugelsang, the chief science officer of Novozymes. And we have uh, Joshua Hoffman, co-founder and CEO of Zymogen and Daphne Koller, founder and CEO of Incitro. So this uh, will be a uh, hopefully fascinating discussion. With that, and without further ado, Michelle, I might hand it over to you. Thank you, Matthias. The marriage of biology and silicon is po poised to unleash literal life-changing innovations. McKinsey calls it the bio-revolution, which we here at Bio think is extremely well put. In the coming decades, this bio-revolution could lead to a world that is more sustainable, extend human lifespans, and address some of the great challenges of our time. We are seeing glimmers of this potential in the response to COVID-19, allowing for faster identification of the virus, more effective diagnostics and health tech tools, and new bioengineered treatments. But what we are seeing now is only the starting um, tip of the iceberg, of what the bio-revolution may make possible. As a new wave of innovation comes out of the lab and into the marketplace, these new capabilities could transform what we eat and wear, our health and how we build our physical world. And much like digital technologies have reshaped industries, we expect biology will be equally momentous. In the longer term, every sector may be affected as bio-innovation transforms profit pools, value chains and business models. In the years ahead, if you are not using biology to make products, you will likely be consuming products made that way. The hundreds of applications illustrated in McKinsey's research give a sense of the breadth of applicability of the bioinnovation spectrum. But unlocking the opportunities depends upon the consumer, societal, and regulatory acceptance of these new capabilities. And that means that leaders in business, the scientific community, and policy will need to engage in a serious and sustained conversation about the profound risks and how best to manage them. In this dark and difficult moment of COVID-19, McKinsey's new report is a source of hope and optimism and shows the enormous potential of biological science in response to the challenges humanity is facing. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matai, who is one of our great thought leaders in this space. Thank you, Matai. Michelle, thank you for your kind words. Um, and during this age of biologi biological science, we, we are sure you will be a terrific steward of bio, as a bio organization in this new chapter of science and innovation that happens around us. Now, I would want to rewind uh, wind back a little bit and how did that actually start? Because this is also a discussion of the fundamentals of the bio revolution. So, I mean, we, start, we kicked off this work uh, roughly one year ago and um, let me explain a little bit what was the driver of this research. So certainly the year 2000 was an important year. The draft of the human genome was uh, coming out of the human genome project. And perhaps somebody might ask, oh, wasn't that the right moment? We believe now is the moment. And when I say now, I mean the last few years and perhaps the coming few years based on the visible pipeline. We see progress on biological understanding and biological techniques. CRISPR has one as a genome editing um, technology is perhaps one where we can modify the genetic code in very specific ways. But there's way more. I mean, if you think about how, for instance, we can suddenly 
um, um, modify stem cells, even in a, in a high throughput uh, setup. But let me move to a second driver of the biorevolution. We believe, or we believed at the time, there's confluence with computing, automation, and AI. So to, to bring one very basic example, I mean, I have here panel members who are way better equipped than I am, so I take a very basic one, data storage. So in the year 2000 that I mentioned, um, to store as a human genome, so we talk about 2.96 billion base pairs. I mean, and, and I did a little bit of back of the envelope calculation and would have roughly costed $17 to store that data. No processing, nothing, not the data generation, just the storage, which was already way cheaper than even 10 years before that in 1990. Today, you would perhaps pay 0.004 cents, so an innovation factor of more than 4,000, only over that period. Again, a very basic example, but perhaps to illustrate a little bit the innovation uh, force behind this. Now, we looked at the um, confluence, and I mean, we coined it the biorevolution. Now, um, and, and if you can maybe have uh, the next slide, which is in fact only coining that term. Um, basically, we ask the question, is a bio-revolution happening now? How broad is it? Is it actually pharma and agro only, or is it cutting across industries? How big is it? How big is the impact? As you can tell, as we have released this research, we answer that with a yes. And that's something we want to discuss today because we, we see now um, the biorevolution at a tipping point. But let me, like Michelle, also briefly comment on COVID. So this work started way before. We, nobody of us would have imagined the world we are living in today. However, we do believe um, the pandemic actually increases the urgency to discuss this matter. Because on the one hand, it shows the opportunity. And we, we, have, uh, we are showing the data is the acceleration of getting to the sequence of the virus as one example. So biology provides the tools to actually rescue us from this. However, it shows also the risk and suddenly biology is in, in much more in the public, uh, public attention, let's say. And it shows definitely the risk. Now this virus is man-made, but I mean, I think uh, we also need to discuss how to handle these technology, uh, technologies in a mindful way. Now, Michael, why don't you um, uh, share a little bit with us how we approach this research and what we see? Thanks, Matthias. I uh, just want to describe uh, very briefly uh, you know, what the scope was of, of the sets of uh, use cases that we looked at uh, as we did this research. Uh, at MGI, we talked about sometimes using a micro to macro methodology. It's trying to understand things at the micro level, um, not necessarily with regard to their physical size, although that's relevant here and then understand what that might mean for the economy. And so really we looked at four different uh, arenas uh, where biology uh, and this industry has actually been driving forward. Um, first is biomolecules at the molecular level. Uh, you know, as, as Matthias mentioned, whether it's sequencing or, or manipulating um, you know, genetic code through CRISPR and other tools, um, that's in an arena where we see uh, tremendous uh, innovation um, and certainly both on the science as well as on the engineering side. Um, but then you can also level up to, to the level of uh, biosystems. Uh, so collections of, of cells, uh, whether it's organs or, or entire organisms. Uh, again, we're seeing real innovation there. Um, and by the way, as, as Matthias was saying, you know, outside of necessarily just the health and, uh, and health and human performance, uh, you know, we culture meat is one example there. Um, thirdly, this uh, confluence in a very uh, literal way between biology uh, and the IT world. Uh, and these are, you know, examples such as uh, neural interfaces. And then finally, the, the actual use of biology for computing, um, which we do in our analysis, uh, think is a little farther off. And yet, uh, you know, to the extent to which that's theoretically possible, uh, potentially quite compelling and, and disruptive. Um, as we analyze, you know, over 400 different use cases, and we'll come back to some of the findings from the overall research there, uh, we did uh, synthesize up to five different ways uh, which transformative capabilities, which really can affect entire industries and affect the entire economy. And these, you know, can be driven down to specific ways in which you could use these technologies we just mentioned. First, uh, changing the, the production process, uh, improving the performance of materials, uh, sustainability, a number of ways in which uh, certainly there, that, that we're seeing, um, you know, the ability to produce materials actually change over time. 
uh, the ability to be more precise, uh, to, to be more targeted in your actions. That's clearly true in you know, areas such as precision medicine, but we also see precision in front of a lot of other industries like agriculture as well. Um, the ability to actually reprogram life. Uh, again, you know, this, this essentially is what CRISPR and other techniques do, uh, but that, that is a transformative capability given that, you know, indeed, you know, I come from a computer science background. The idea to program something is incredibly powerful. Um, we do know there are challenges in R&D productivity in various industries. Uh, we do see advances, again, with this confluence of IT and Moore's Law helping out uh, the ability to improve productivity in R&D. Uh, and then finally, this, this growing literal connection between biology um, and, and the uh, information technology world. But with that, let me turn it back over to Matthias, who will describe a little bit about why we think the scope and scale of this potential is so large. Thank you, Michael. I will do this briefly, and I will try to introduce four key figures from this work. 60% is one of them. I mean, this is what we believe is the full potential of physical inputs that could be produced using biological means. So this is a, a staggering number. I mean, we started with our assumption that, of course, 20% of, of the economy are uh, biological materials like wood, paper, etc. But this is our bottom-up estimate as a potential. I would also argue that this, of course, also opens the door to biomaterials with, with different, um, uh, I mean, of, of different nature, with superior features. And I'm sure our panel will talk about it. Let's go to the second number. This is a number uh, of 45%, which is out of the world of health. What we did here is we looked at the bottom-up model. We looked at all the entire worldwide disease burden. And we looked at um, what's actually in the visible pipeline. So this is not dreaming it up what would be possible, but more what's, let's say, with a certain probability, certainly possible. So this is already a high number in terms of unmet need that could be tackled. Let's come to the third number. This is more at the capability level and how R&D could be impacted. This is a more straightforward estimate that we looked at the global R&D spend and said, what could be impacted by biology, biologically relevant uh, or related technologies? And that leads us to health, food, paper, and un, um, other areas of R&D. And last but not least, come, let's come to our last number. Uh, uh, some research we, we added and, and focused quite a bit on over the last few months in terms of impact on greenhouse gas and gas because we believe biology can have also a significant influence as shown here on sustainability. And there are tons of examples, for instance, how new bio routes can impact how fabrics and dyes are produced in a more sustainable way. And I'm sure we'll discuss many more examples. But those four figures should just show you the breadth and the level of impact. Um, but Michael, maybe, maybe we go a little bit more into detail and then we open up for discussion. We have over 400 different individual use cases that we uh, what, that we examine, and again, you can you can uh, look at this uh, report for free actually on the, on the web. Um, and for each of those, we try to understand what the drivers of value might be, um, and then for each of those, try to expand it to say, look, if if we look at potential curves of adoption, what might what might the economic potential be? And by the way, that's not just you know profits to the industry, but actually benefits to the world, whether it's patients who live longer or have better lives or whether it's reduced greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. And one of the things that we noted is that certainly we understand there's tremendous potential within the health and human performance space, healthcare, for instance, improving healthcare, preventing disease, massive amounts of you know, potential reduction in, in disease burden, as Matthias was talking about, and agriculture, again, another place where we do see these, uh, these advances uh, historically moving. But then, when, then we can also look in the consumer space. Um, and again, whether it's uh, targeted diets, uh, whether it's uh, cosmetics, uh, there are a large number of places where these bio routes can actually create products and services which consumers could value. Um, and then also in, in materials and energy. And again, we, we know that this history here has been in some cases challenging for economic reasons, and that we do actually believe that there is real potential here. If you add it all up, even just the direct impacts of these technologies could be in the two to four trillion range uh, within a decade or two. And by the way, that's, that's only the direct impacts of these technologies. That doesn't even, even include the upstream and downstream impacts um, you know, that, that can happen within the supply chain or 
you know, in ancillary or uh, related fields, obviously, you know, the life insurance industry is going to change as life, life expectancies change. And so we truly do think that, that this is both a broad as well as a, a deep, um, you know, set of, of potentials. That said, there are indeed risks associated with these technologies that we do acknowledge. Um, and, and some of them are unique to these technologies, relatively unique to these technologies. Some of these are echoes of other disruptive technologies we've seen in the past. Um, so, for instance, the digital technologies, there have been concerns about privacy there. Again, you can see that echo when it comes to, for instance, um, you know, someone's genetic information. Uh, and so, in some ways, you know, we can bring forward some of the learnings, maybe the, some of the regulatory regimes, or at least the policy discussions uh, around privacy from other fields where that's already been tackled. But then there are, you know, the, it is true about life, uh, in fact, that it is, in many cases, self-replicating. Uh, it doesn't necessarily respect, uh, you know, uh, country borders. You know, if a seed blows over our border, right, that, that's going to happen, or a gene drive modified organism moves from one place to another. And so we do have to understand these risks. And again, many of these risks are, are, are double-edged. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things about the decrease in, in cost, the increasing accessibility of these technologies means that, for instance, you know, people could, can work on SARS-CoV-2 um, in any lab around the world because now this technology is available. And so that, that innovation now can become globalized. But that also means that there are, you know, people who might make mistakes um, and those unintended consequences or, in fact, malicious actors. And so those are some of the risks, uh, you know, that have to be considered. And, and um, you know, fortunately, there is a history uh, of considering that in, within this field. That said, you know, many of these uh, innovations we do see covered in the press. I think one of the things, contributions of our research is to take seriously what it takes to get from the lab into the marketplace. Certainly, if you, have, you have to solve the science. That's absolutely true. And that requires real investment, um, continuing investment, and we hope that continues. But then there are a set, set of commercial challenges. Uh, you have to have a value proposition for the customer. Uh, you need to solve the business model problem. And of course, that is going to change over time. If you can cure a disease with a single treatment, that's going to change the way you think about pricing, for instance. Um, you know, how can you actually go to market um, in, a, in an effective and a, a efficient way? Um, and then scaling, uh, if particularly, you know, we mentioned materials production. Uh, it's one thing to produce, you know, lab uh, quality, but, you know, lab scale of, of material. It's another thing altogether. Uh, to create commercial and industrial scale of, of materials. And underlying it all um, is the need to be able to engage in the public policy debates, uh, the risk understanding, et cetera, if you're actually going to achieve any of these benefits. Um, and so then we did try to model out all of these, um, uh, the, the potential timing where, you know, if you look at the S-curve where there's an acceleration, um, you know, no, no need for me to read these all out to you. And again, they're, they're in our report, but we do think there are some things which clearly are already accelerating in their market adoption. Uh, there are some of other uh, types of technologies and products and services, which we do think are a little farther out and some that are, you know, perhaps in the, in the, in the third horizon as well. Um, and that's because you do have to solve all of these problems in order to get to market. Again, it's not to say that some of these might appear in the market earlier, but when we actually see this curve of adoption accelerate, uh, we think that there'd be significant variation there. So what, what role do we have to, to play? And, you know, many players in the bio ecosystem are already playing these roles. We do have biology first business models, uh, and, and those are represented on our panel. Um, we do have a new level of personalization. What can you think about? And again, you know, you can carry this over from digital. What can you think about when you're actually able to use precision, either down to the person, either down to the, the square centimeter on a, on a farm field, uh, into a particular person's skin, et cetera. Value chains will be disrupted uh, when you do have alternative bio routes um, to producing a type of product, say, you know, meat, whether it's, you know, animal proteins, lab grown versus uh, farm grown, or in fact, uh, you know, um, uh, plant-based substitutes, that's going to change the game. We do have a confluence of disciplines as Matthias made reference to very early on. Um, it is partly Moore's law, which is allowing all of these biological technologies to develop in which the ways they can. And there is a, a, a role here in the public policy space uh, and, the, and the regulatory space to play. So again, you can, you can find the report um, uh, on the web at, at, uh, for free. Uh, but uh, l let's go to our panel. Uh, we, we are blessed to have a terrific set of, uh, of folks joining us here. And, and let me just start. Uh, you know, Matthias uh, asked the question, or we said, he said that one of the questions that we asked as part of our research is, do we actually think there's a biological revolution going on? Do we think that this point in time, after hundreds of years of biological innovation uh, in science, that in fact that we're at a, 
unique inflection point. Uh, and Klaus, just because you show up uh, first on our uh, on my uh, Zoom screen, let, let me start with you. Um, do you think we're at a special time, and if so, why? I, I, I think so, uh, uh, and I, I think it goes back to what you started uh, uh, with uh, uh, talking about the human genome. The fact that you can write and read a DNA to the extent and efficiency and cost, you can do it today. Uh, that, that opens the uh, space uh, for, 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 for really uh, uh, manipulating uh, biology uh, to a much, much larger degree. Uh, that combined, of course, with the toolbox, as you elaborate with CRISPR and so on. I mean, we've always been able to manipulate D D DNA for a long time. We've had recombinant products uh, for th more than plus 30 years, right? But the speed at which, at which you can do it. Now, if you combine that with uh, AI, and uh, then, then something is happening. So, so, so maybe it was not, well, it was a revolution to get the human genome, but actually the real revolution is when you can get your genome, right? Your personal genome and you can actually plug it in to an AI learning machine to look at disease patterns uh, in, in human populations and I think there's a, a recent study I don't know if it was last year coming out on on on, on cancer uh, uh, markers uh, just plugging in uh, uh, human genome data uh, from uh, various uh, patients and then having an algorithm uh, trained on, on disease patterns, uh, the, uh, and, and you find a new uh, surprising uh, uh, connections. And that's where you could say the, the, the real revolution, when you can actually start to, to use it, right? Uh, first time we see technologies come, it comes with a, a lot of promise, but it usually takes a few years uh, to evolve before you actually see the outcomes. And I, th I think we start to see the outcomes now uh, from, from where these technologies has uh, improved. So, yes. Daphne, if I could turn to you, and you know, Klaus made reference to AI. We know each other at first, I think, partly because of our shared background in machine learning. Um, you know, you, now you're devoting a, a lot of your time in this field. Uh, what did you see that, 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 that uh, made this particularly attractive at this point in time? Is, is this a special time? No, I think absolutely it is a special time and the enablers of this special time is the creation of these tools that um, I think you made reference to earlier, CRISPR being one but not the only one. There's multiple tools and how we measure um, living beings using single cell, even at the single cell level using RNA sequencing. Um, there is the creation of new biological entities that would not otherwise have arisen using the ability to reprogram IPS cells. And what's exciting to me about this is that these are now modular building blocks that you can put together and start creating larger um, units that are almost kind of like a programming language in its own right. So I actually like to think of this as digital biology, which I think is a large subset of what you call the biorevolution. And it's a transformation that I've seen on the tech side in the years that I've been on the machine learning AI side of the world where we started out with really clunky, complicated tools where we were basically programming computers at the level of, you know, very fine grained machine instructions and only the experts were able to innovate and do anything meaningful. And the building blocks became more powerful, more robust and more uh, modular so you could actually start putting together mm -hmm. even as a relatively less experienced uh, programmer, if you will, things that are really transformative. And we're starting to see that revolution emerging on the digital biology side, where you can start saying, okay, I'm going to take CRISPR and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And you can put AI into the mix as well as some of those components. And I think it opens the door to some truly transformative combinations that even uh, and enable innovation among a much larger group of people because you no longer need to be an expert in every single piece in order to put them together. Josh, maybe I could turn to you. You, uh, you lead one of these bio-based business, uh, bio business model uh, companies, and you've been at it for a while. Uh, what's your assessment of where we are? And, um, and uh, you know, I mean, it could go back to the founding of the company, but also, you know, as it's developed over time. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say a couple things. One, um, and I don't know whether I agree or disagree with Klaus or Daphne, so we'll see. Um, <laughs> one, first and most importantly, I absolutely agree that we are at a transformational moment 
uh, in the integration of a disparate set of technologies uh, that have the impact of scale of the sort that you guys talk about, right? World important scale. Let's not quibble over two trillion or four trillion, whatever, big numbers, right? Um, I, I guess the metaphor that I use uh, is, and this is a place where I think the language, language does us a disservice. We talk about the ability to read the genome. And I actually think that's wrong. We have the ability to transcribe the genome. Uh, we have the ability to understand down to the base pair level, right? Base four code, what these genomes do, and we get to do it cheaply and quickly and efficiently. That's magic. But it's not the same as reading it. And by reading it, I'm imbuing that word with some semantic understanding, right? Imagine if you took the Google code base and you put it into base four code. We wouldn't really understand it, right? And so I think we're just beginning to understand how to read. And I think that our ability to learn how to read is uh, hugely enabled by a combination of uh, uh, new genetic engineering tools, things like CRISPR-Cas9, uh, that allow us to play with small changes, right? We get to sort of see what these, these changes in words or these changes in letters, or these change in, changes in phonemes mean. Uh, by substantial increases in automation that allow us to have reliable experimentation, right? We have a reliability challenge in life sciences research independent of any of this, right? So now you get precision at a very like boring but quite important level. And frankly, the huge increase in uh, quality and cost effectiveness of cloud computing tools really since 2015 when Microsoft and Google started to compete with AWS, right? We saw a huge step change. We've been in the business since then. This huge step change in the cost, quality, reliability of cloud computing since 2015. Um, and that, that set of combinations allows us, I believe, to learn how to read. And so the question for me is, how quickly can we learn how to read? So that's point one. Point two, and this is where I think that there's power in the metaphor, but I think we have to be careful. I don't believe that we're gonna be able to program biology in exactly the way that we program digital systems. Um, biology is nonlinear. It has tons of feedback loops. It's been evolving for you know, millions of years in very complicated ways. And I think the metaphor of abstracting biology in the way that uh, computer scientists have done uh, with respect to, for example, uh, the APIs that allow you to build something like AWS, I think that that's gonna lead us slightly astray. I think we have more of a journey of discovery ahead. So I don't know, I mean, I'm pretty excited about where we are. I think these use cases are becoming real, but I think it's a little bit more complicated and it's complicated at the level of the technology. I can't tell if I've horrified or, or uh, Daphne and Klaus. No, I, I don't know. I'm an open dialogue, so go ahead, please. <laughs> not, not, not at all, I, I, I actually tend to agree a lot. Uh, reading DNA is one thing. The translation comes when you are able to put it to use, of course, and, and, uh, and here, as you say, we are helped by the, the fact that the automation helps a lot in, in both the, the deconstruction, you could say, of an organism to learn what the different components do in an organism, but then also measure change outcomes as you as you as you manipulate it. So it's uh, that, that's hugely important. That that that's what, that's why it wasn't the revolution to get the genome. It, it's when you start uh, being able to do the translation. I, I think uh, Josh is very right there. Uh, uh, but but there is elements to to what I I, I do think you yeah we we won't program to, uh, biology from 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 the bottom. But, but we'll be able to combine elements, so engineer things. And, and, and that's really important. Uh, you can take chunks of what you know works to put along with chunks, other chunks that you know works. And, and that comes in, so it becomes an engineering thing, uh, which used to be an artsy, you could say artsy biology thing, becomes a, uh, you know, with the knowledge of the genome you, uh, and the knowledge of how, what it translates to, you can engineer the bits and pieces in a much uh, bigger way than uh, we used to be able to do. That, that's important. Um, it's interesting because it almost be, all of the speakers are talking about how information technology has just allowed a, a orders of magnitude leap in scale and speed. And we're definitely seeing that impact on speed um, in the life sciences. You think just about this, what we've seen in the first 16 weeks of dealing with COVID how biomember companies have started over 400 projects, 130 of which are focused on developing new vaccines, all within the space of 16 weeks. That kind of unprecedented speed and scale um, is something that we haven't seen before. 
Daphne, go ahead. I yeah, and I, so first of all, I want to agree with Josh that uh, it's important for all of us to maintain a, a sense of humility about the complexity of biological systems. Uh, it's very easy to fall trapped to the metaphor of, you know, it's going to be just like programming computers. And, <laughs> Um, and I've seen many people kind of make what I consider to be ludicrous promises about, you know, in my space, oh, we're going to have 100 drugs in 10 years. And, and biology is hard and we do not understand it. And we're only just beginning to sort of get an understanding of how the building blocks uh, fit together. And we discover new types of building blocks every year or so that are like, whoa, I didn't think about that. And it exists and it com complicates the whole thing even further. But at the same time, I do think that using the tools that we're now starting to kind of robustify and, and define well, it does give us the opportunity to much more rapidly interrogate biology, much more rapidly mm -hmm. understand those cause effect relationships, um, and really start to build systems that are not going to be as nicely nailed down as electronic systems, but at least you can start building systems from those building blocks. And that's what enabled what Michelle has described and that we're seeing in the context of COVID-19 and hopefully in, in other areas as well. And I think that ability and the democratization that that's enabled in terms of so many people that do not need to have multi-billion dollar companies behind them, um, that enables this incredible progress, which is exactly what we've seen on the technology side, where you no longer need to be part of a large corporation in order to create, in that case, an app that reaches you know, hundreds of millions of people. We're now able to provide that level of democratic access to this technology in the biology space to a much larger number of innovators. And you never know where in the world innovation might come. And to me, that is a particularly exciting aspect of providing smart people all over the world with the opportunity to do something that is potentially transformative. I mean, Daphne, not I, as a con con consultant, but more as a, as a no, I don't want to say former scientist, but I mean, A, that's exciting. And I wonder if there's something by adding Josh and you, your comment, because I mean, I, I think it's appealing to talk about these building blocks and maybe what you're also saying, these are new building blocks, because I would move from promises to actually new requirements. Because, I mean, maybe it's too strong what I'm now saying, but to really understand biology, because it's in no way is linear, you need AI. I mean, it's beyond the human comprehension to actually understand. And for many, many years, we have followed reductionist ways. So yes. you need this new toolkit. So, here, here. I mean, maybe we frame it I, at the beginning of something interesting. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I can easily imagine a world where Daphne and I might have abstruse, Talmudic, uninteresting differences of opinion about that point. But I think at the core, what you're saying is exactly right. And I think you used a word that's, uh, I think you said something that's very important, Matthias, which is we have followed reductionist approaches that I think do not work in the face of the complexity of the world. And now we are given we have the opportunity to take a set of tools that allow us to take um, an integrationist approach and being imprecise in the word integrationist. And those tools, we're gonna have to continue to push. I'm excited actually about the ability to use biology to push another generation of machine learning tools at its core, right? For a bunch of reasons, and I'm gonna stop because I'm gonna wade into Daphne's part of the pool here. But I mean, I think that that we'll see moving, you know, movements beyond a sort of deep learning, you know, Jeff Hinton, Waterloo kind of school. And it's not that there's not power in those techniques, but I think we're going to create new techniques as well. But I would, can I, can I, I want to come back at this though, because you said something that's interesting. We're talking about the technology and I think the technology is part of it, but there's another reason why I think now is the right time, which is um, we need to find foundational ways of creating growth and productivity in the economy that don't involve digital technologies or pharmaceuticals, right? The chemicals and materials sector, right? It's something I know well. It's a $3 trillion sector. It trades at 1x revenue, right? There's no growth. It grows at GDP, right? And yet, it's not like the world doesn't need advances in chemical and materials, right? All you have to do is look at EU regulations around uh, end-of-life treatment for plastics, right? In the food industry, all you have to do is look at the huge disconnect between 
uh, protein available and protein needs coming by 2050. So we've got these really foundational needs in the economy and in society. And the current ways we have of producing stuff, frankly, just aren't going to get us there. Right. And so I think what you have is a wonderful moment where the needs are profound at the same time that the technologies are maturing. And it's that combination kind of of the super stupid, the supply and the demand side that makes this exciting. And then when you put in what Daphne said, which is the ability, the democratization of these research efforts. I mean, I was uh, texting with my CTO just before this, and I was asking him if he had to build our platform in 2014, could he have done it? And the answer was no. He's like, we would have had to spend $150 million on server costs, right? Um, like it just, it was impossible to have done. And so I think, I think you really get this very exciting moment. So that for me is, it, it is the, if you don't have the market, you kind of don't have anything. And that's the other part that's super exciting for me. So and from I'm, the MGI perspective, oh, go ahead, Jesse, please. Well, I was gonna agree with Josh, but wondering why you excluded the pharmaceutical industry as a potential growth area. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, it's, I, 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 we, this is now gets to be, I, I shouldn't have, it was poor, it was sloppy language. I would say the following, we believe that there are rightly a set of regulatory and social concerns around the approval of new pharmaceuticals that mean that that process will be slower than non-pharmaceutical processes. And frankly, I think that's probably okay, right? Just as a guy building a business, it's gonna take longer. I mean, make this very real. We are selling our first, the first product we've developed in market right now. We started developing it four years ago. We've gone from idea to manufactured product in four years. It's an electronic film, it's an optical film that makes better touch screens, right? We would never be able to do, and we did it for $40 million. We would never have been able to do something like that in pharmaceuticals. And yet the learnings we have, right? And so that for me is the- I'm going to disagree ah, with please. You. So, I mean, I, first of all, there have been drugs, not many, I admit, but some drugs that even with the technologies that existed prior have been brought to market in four to five years. Uh, that doesn't mean we should get sloppy about regulatory aspects and of course, human trials and so on. But I think we have been, doing things in the pharmaceutical space in such a broken, slow way where we have not taken, for instance, the notion of precision and really targeting our, for our drugs to the right population where you see an effect size that is dramatic rather than needing to have a clinical trial of 15,000 people to you know, squint at the statistics and hope you see a p-value. And I think there are opportunities for us to accelerate this process. So not every drug is going to be approved in four to five years, even in the most ideal scenario. But I would hope that more and more, we would be able to create um, products there that will also be moving faster than the current industry yeah. norm, which is, you know, 10 to 15 years and a 5% success rate. And, and to Daphne's point, and to Michael's opening comments, we're going to see the same sort of evolution and revolution in the techniques and approaches that are used to regulate these areas as well as develop new technologies. So if you think about real world evidence and artificial intelligence moving into our clinical evaluation of new pharmaceuticals, we will soon be able to move at that same lightning speed in detecting the efficacy and safety of therapies as we are in the developing of the therapies to begin with. Here, here. No, uh, I, can I, I ask think a question? Uh, if I can say something. Uh, but I think uh, Josh actually touches a, a, a very interesting point and it goes beyond pharmaceutical. It actually goes to the use of these types of technology for new solutions, right? I mean, and how the whole regulatory environment will follow suit. Uh, if, if you sort of consider some of the industrial applications that, that we work in, there's a very different path to market uh, from a regulatory perspective, depending on the countries you operate in. And, 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 and they can't simply, in some area, countries, not keep up with technology, uh, meaning that, 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 that they put in, 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 at work uh, regulatory processes that simply doesn't allow the technology to flow into markets. But this, uh, is a key, this is a key point, because yeah. just as science and development is becoming globalized, regula regulation also has to be globalized and harmonized. We can no longer have this very balkanized approach to detecting whether or not we trust in a technology on a country by country basis. We have to tackle it as a globe um, mm -hmm. if we're going to keep up with the speed of progress. Let me shift gears a little bit and uh, segue a little bit off of, of another uh, provocation that Josh made there about building a business. 
Um, you know, we all know that this isn't the first time where biological innovations have been used to create businesses, uh, but there have been challenges, right? We look at the promise of biofuels, uh, and, you know, that was challenged over time. Um, you know, Josh, you and I have talked a little bit. Uh, maybe you could extend a little bit about where the challenges might be here, um, because we have a long history of, of promise. Uh, and as Matthias and I described, we do think there is real promise here. Um, but, but what are some of the things that have to be overcome? Well, I, th I think the first thing to appreciate is, um, and, and I, I like to look at stuff with a little bit of a historical perspective. If you go back to the beginning of biotech, right, in the late 70s and the early 80s, right, companies like Cetus, right, Chiron, the early Genentech stuff, everybody was looking at non, in addition to pharmaceuticals, everybody was looking at non-pharmaceutical applications, right? My, my quote is, you know, Amgen's paper, first paper on Science Magazine, was E. coli making indigo dye in like 1980. Yeah. Um, and yet, with the exception of Novozymes, where, where Klaus is and, and their competitor, I think we haven't really seen much that come to fruition. And I think we haven't because the manufacturing is hard, because it's hard to engineer the biology. Uh, and I think that if you look at what happened in biofuels, people took a nascent technology and tried to apply it against one of the largest commodity markets on the planet. And that requires a level of efficiency that's crazy right? Almost impossible. It was kind of, a, it was right at the edges of, of doable, uh, if you looked at it on paper. And then once you put the inevitable friction that comes in trying to go after a large scale competitive market, it was very, very hard. I think we're in a different place today. Um, I hope. One is, I think that we're able to think differently about use cases that are a little bit more specialized, right? New use cases. Um, and so, you know, the, the analogy is the Model S, the Tesla Model S as the gateway into EVs, right? It wasn't the Model 3. It wasn't something that was going to compete with a Honda Accord, right? And so I think we want to find those, number one. Number two, I think we are far more thoughtful about manufacturing. Now, that's a thing we at Zymergen have spent a lot of time thinking about and working on, so maybe we have a different perspective. But manufacturing is still the challenge on the non-therapeutic side. I think it's different on the therapeutic side. Um, and I think we're in a much better place in part not in part, in large part because of the kinds of technological tools that have been developed that we've been talking about, whether it's AI, whether it's the infrastructure, the software infrastructure that enables it, whether it's automation, I mean, th those things allow us to solve this manufacturability problem that haunted the industry previously. They're really interesting. Actually, if I can turn to you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, no, go, please go ahead and ask your question, Michael. Oh, I was going to ask, you waded into an industry with obviously a ton of history. You know, what, <laughs> tell us more. Uh, so I think in some respects, you could say that I'm uh, in the fortunate position of having an industry with a well-defined, well-recognized business model. I don't need to convince someone to use digital therapeutics. Um, ultimately, what I hope to be producing is a is a drug and then there's well-defined market dynamics for the drug, which means that I can focus my innovation at this point on creating a better product rather than trying to create a market where one does not currently exist. So um, in that respect, I think I've, I don't wanna say an easier problem, but the problems that I need to solve lie in a different direction. That being said, um, there's some very interesting parallels between Josh, what Josh just described and the failures that we've seen on the business model and some of the earlier waves of innovation that happened in the internet revolution on the tech side, where initially people waded in with you know, grandiose ideas about building entire marketplaces that did not exist. And that too was not something that um, in the early waves of of um, this, these didn't actually pan out. And uh, what we're now starting to see is a much greater focus on things like unit economics, which is the analog to uh, Josh's cogs of manufacturing and being really thoughtful upfront about making sure that you have, um, that you have a sustainable path forward, assuming that you grow to scale, that there will in fact be a positive unit economics rather than a negative one. Uh, and I think that there's interesting lessons that I would encourage entrepreneurs going into this space to think about in terms of the, the failures that, um, that we've seen on the tech side and how to avoid repeating those mistakes here so that hopefully we don't have uh, a trough in the middle of this revolution in the same way that we had on the tech side. Daphne, um, uh, can you mention what some of those, uh, what those learnings are? 
So the um, so the unit economics is an important one. The growth at the face of everything else being the single imperative is another mistake that many of those made. And Josh, you earlier referred to um, finding a, in, at least starting off by finding a market where you are, where you have a chance of dominating. And that might be a smaller market that is well-defined, but where your group of early adopters, so to speak, are really the market. Uh, because I think a lot of the tech companies that went into markets failed because they got enamored by the fact that they had an initial sort of hockey stick-like growth uh, where um, that was driven largely by early adopters who uh, were passionate about the product, but because they aimed not at that sector, but at a much larger sector, that very quickly kind of plateaued and then kind of bounced along. And if you are not careful about how you target that market and ensure that your economics are sustainable with that market, then th those companies basically ultimately failed. And we've seen that in the earlier Webvan and Pets.com. Ariba. I'm sorry? Ariba, remember yeah. that. There's so many of those examples. Totally. And I think if we want, and I see parallels here, that I think we should be thoughtful as an industry, and maybe this is a call to action to Michelle, who gets to talk to a lot of those companies. Can we learn a lesson from the failures um, of the initial wave of the Web 1.0 companies so that we don't have that big trough in the middle before we got to Web 2.0 and a set of companies that did have sustainability and able to make an economic, um, you know, real economic success? Can I add a couple things to what Daphne said? Because I agree entirely with what she's saying. And I think the the learnings are really important. I do think that there are a couple of other things that make this more complicated even. One is we have real technical risk in our companies. Um, the science matters, right? This is not a case where you can have something that kind of works or works pretty well, right? This is a case where the physical laws of the universe will tell us whether we're true or not. And that is a little bit different than in the pure technology world. And that requires, I think, both, and Daphne used the word earlier, a humility in front of it. I think it requires entrepreneurs and investors to take that seriously in a way that maybe they don't always do so. Um, I mean, if you want to hear something amusing, go look at Pat Brown, who knows way more about this than certainly I do, talk about how uh, this is the Impossible Food CEO, um, talk about you know his view of investors. I, I think it's... Um, I think it's, it's important to take that. I think the second piece that's different is the cycle times for product innovation in the pure technology world are much, much faster than in our world, right? You can find, you can iterate on a product in days, weeks, right? Quarters would be slow, right? In our world, you, you just can't, right? And so I think that those two things require, um, they, they make it extra important, some of what Daphne was saying, which is, the focus on unit economics, the focus against growth at all costs, right? I don't think that this market has quite the same winner take all dynamics that a networked economy like a Google does. Um, I think that it's different. And I think that it's e even more important, therefore, that we're kind of humble. And I guess I feel a little bit of responsibility as one of the larger kind of forefront of this generation companies to make sure we don't mess it up precisely for those reasons. Klaus, uh, Novozymes has been described as one of the survivors of the early days. Yeah, yeah uh, no, but, but, but there's some, some, so, something to be said about, I mean, where you choose to, to play your technology, right? I mean, as I just alluded to before, a, a, lot, a, a lot of sort of, the, you know, innovation in, in the sort of the biotech space, if we at least talk uh, industrial biotech, has been to replace something already existing. And, and here you just run into economics, right? Nobody's going to pay you to become greener, so to say, unless there are some other mechanisms in place. Uh, and and, 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 and so, so why is it that a lot of sort of innovation companies in this space want to replace something that exists rather than innovate for something new, right? Uh, you know, you, you have to play a different 
uh, gain here. Uh, or at least you, very, you, you have to solve the economic point up front. And you can do that in some industries. Yes, you can take energy savings out and, and provide an enzymatic solution to, let's say, to a, to a catalysis process and, and save on that cost and so on in, in some cases. But, 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 but really, to, why would you choose to make a biopolymer to compete with P, PVA or, or PET rather than finding, uh, you know, substitute some, something new, new, new benefits, so to say, right, and, and so on and so forth. I, I think that's very important if you want success in this space. And 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 and, and honestly, we've learned uh, also the hard way in the biofuels that, that you need to be competitive. And yes, you can do it on some substrates, like uh, the, the, the the corn biofuel example in the U.S. They they trade uh, uh, corn ethanol to the tune of one dollar thirty a gallon, which is. Uh, close to cost competitive with, with oil, even at the prices they are at now. Uh, but, but that's a different story. That's one of the few, if you, if you sort of bedded all of your uh, sort of a biotech technology to, to replace all your chemicals, we would lose and we would also lose as society. We have to find the new ways of producing other things than necessarily uh, rather than a direct substitution. Does, does it make any sense? Um, uh, that's great. Uh, Klaus, I'm going to let, let the audience decide what makes sense, but uh, <laughs> so your experience is valued. Michelle, I could come to you. Uh, you know, it, uh, what do you talk about when you talk with bio members? What, what are some of the challenges that have to be overcome in this moment? Yeah, well, you know, I do think figuring out what you know, Daphne referred to an established business model in the life sciences, particularly in the pharmaceutical space, but I do think placing a value on these new um, scientific leaps and bounds is something that's still um, an unclosed book. Um, we are not valuing these technologies and these advances um, in, in an appropriate way, um, in a sufficient way. And that, I think, is the one thing slowing down the rate of this progress. Um, we have to have the right economic incentives. We have to ha explain to the public why these incentives matter, why these scientific leaps are so great, and why these products are transformative for their lives and for society. And that is the case that I think we're gonna really have to make going forward. We make things look easy sometimes, mm -hmm. um, which is the grace and skill and beauty of scientists, um, but it's sometimes to the detriment of our businesses and we want us to have a healthy sector going forward. And you know, what are some of the challenges going forward here? Who are you asking? Who are you? Matthias. First, Klaus and me. Matthias, uh, go ahead. Okay, okay. So first, me, then, then, then perhaps Klaus. No, um, I mean, I was a little bit taking notes here as my colleagues on the panel talked about it. So in terms of challenges, there is something around the business models, and I don't want to to repeat between Daphne, Michelle. I mean, I think there's a common view. I really like that analogy, Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and it's maybe Bio 2.0 to Bio 3.0, because I think, I mean, many entrepreneurs lived through that, but biology is way more complex. So I would put a premium on, on, on a business model. I would put a premium on how to advance that toolkit, because I think, I mean, that discussion we had a couple of minutes ago, the non-reductionist approach to biology, and then, I mean, and now I'm teasing a little bit because I move beyond your question because uh, uh, I think Daphne was nicely putting this word up, democratizing. And we uh, looked at that also in the spirit of risk. And may maybe, I mean, that's also a segue we can look a little bit into because as you can see, I mean, we are definitely optimist and excited about the opportunity. But in a world where we can modify biology, where it's democratizing, and I can order my CRISPR kit and in my garage not suddenly program and build a computer, but modify, I don't want to go into the virus discussion necessarily, but any biological means. I think there's also discussion how we allow entrepreneurship with the right rules around it or the right framework, let's say. So, so those I would put up, Michael. Kind of like entrepreneurship without entropy. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. like <laughs> how can we make sure that that we're always going forward? And you know, to your point, Matai, the other thing that we see with democratization is a flood of information. So yeah. how do we also evolve the tools to really 
um, sift through all of that and get to the really meaningful advances so that we can build upon them as quickly as possible instead of people being lost in tens of thousands of publications per day. No, totally, and maybe here we go full, full circle with Josh's point because, I mean, the laws of the universe matter. I mean, this is not like, I mean, so, so you, you almost have a few boundaries here with, which make it very special, but I, I think you have maybe here a convinced group of the opportunity, but I think how we are talking about now here in this group, there's a build, there's a toolkit, there is complexity, there are learnings from, let's say, Web 2.0, and there's perhaps a unique risk profile. Those are, would, would be some elements from my side, Michael. Perfect. Klaus, did you have a, a word to add? No, I, 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 so I would say that, that in, I, I mean, I'll just talk from the industrial biotech perspective, uh, right? And, and, and uh, I believe that we will see, uh, as, as the tools are democratizing, you would actually see innovations happening a lot more in, in, in various places and sort of the traditional places. For, for, for biology innovation. There, uh, there, there will be companies like ours around to take things to scale and so on. There will be companies like Josh's uh, Simogen that will have a, a complete whole unique sort of set of portfolio of innovation programs, uh, making new materials and, and things like that. But, but there's probably a lot more that will happen out there that, that you have not dreamt about, that, you, that we should be able to pick up uh, uh, because it is democratizing, and 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 uh, yeah, and uh, and hopefully it will not run astray. Uh, so you know, in in, in uh, but 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 uh, come to the benefit of societies in terms of let, let's let's just take the example. Some of some of the examples you mentioned as medium term that we'll see medium term in in, in your slide deck. I, I think is actually happening happening right now. I, I, I think it's not too far in the future that we will see uh, materials being made, we will see uh, cultured meats, uh, we will see some of the elements that you progress is 10 years out in the future. It's, I, I, I believe some of these things to be happening. Uh, on now, we do think there's a decent possibility that cultured meat will be uh, cost competitive with other forms of production uh, within the decade. But just to clarify the chart, that's when yeah. the acceleration yeah. actually begins in the market. Look, this has been the easiest job in the world, uh, moderating uh, with uh, all these incredibly insightful uh, uh, folks on the panel. Um, let's finish this off with a lightning round, if you'll all be willing. There's a way to set a quick questions, quick answers. If you don't like it, you can feel free to pass. Uh, Michelle, I'll give you the first uh, one. We'll ask everybody the same question. Um, so, Michelle, let's start with you. What's your favorite source of information uh, about what we're describing as the biorevolution? Biodigital. <laughs> 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 Great way to start. Josh, go ahead. I confess, I find Twitter incredibly helpful. A well curated Twitter feed is really, really valuable. Daphne. I like reading scientific papers. What can I say, whether it's science or cell or nature genetics, because ultimately it's about the science. Class. I would say networks, scientific networks, whether it's startup environments or, you know, colleagues around the world. Yeah. Let's go back in reverse order now, Klaus. I want to ask you, um, what excites you most about the bio-revolution? The, the unlimited possibilities. I actually have a, this, I, you know, the whole way we do agriculture to, uh, to food materials and, and what have you, is just going to change. Uh, I, I'm a huge believer that that's going to be a revolution. Kathy. The ability to take um, intransigent problems and rethink them from the bottom up using an entirely new toolkit. I've seen that happening in tech and I'm excited to see it happening again. Josh. Um, I, I think to be at the early stages of a core technological revolution that's analogous to the revolutions we saw in the 1860s and 70s, whether it's the network electric grid, the modern petrochemical industry, the internal combustion engine, where you've got these core technologies that are then going to disperse and have huge impact across society. Yeah. The fact that I've been in science 25 years, almost 30 years now, and every three to five years, it's a wonderful world of possibilities that I could not have envisioned at the beginning of that time period. That ability to witness history being made at such a quick pace is inspiring. Perfect. All right, one more. Michelle, we'll start with you. Uh, what one message do you have for the folks uh, or piece of advice do you have for the folks who are uh, watching this? 
be ambitious because it's, it's all of those great ambitions around the world that seed that progress that I love to see and that everyone is relying upon. Josh. Um, I think it's a combination of be humble and realistic about the science. The technology, science, the science matters in a way here that it doesn't. And at the same time, be humble about the ways in which new technologies change our ability to do that. If you're only focused on the revolution, you're going to miss the wisdom of the past. But if you're only focused on the past, you're going to miss the revolution. Daphne? Michelle and Josh stole mine, so I'm going to <laughs> modulate it a little bit and say, under promise and over deliver, which is um, the opposite of what I think caused um, a lot of the early revolutions to fail. Yeah, I would say if you believe that uh, biotechnology is a set path to success, be, be, be sure to change your approach uh, as you move along. It might not go the way you did, uh, you uh, expected, as just said, be humble. Right, uh, and and be prepared to uh, to to, to uh, pivot or, or change your strategy around a few times. Terrific. Well, thank you all on behalf of uh, ourselves as well as Bio. Uh, this has been incredibly uh, engaging and interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.